what's, when's, where's and why's. The wondrous thing about art is that it has a life of its own and no gatekeeper in the world can successfully force it down a path it doesn't want to take. Waldemar Januzak, Sunday Times Magazine, 15th of September 2019. Where is the value of anything in a world where everything is infinitely reproducible? That mid-20th century post-photography debate has been updated in the 21st century with the irresistible progress of the internet. Now everything is digitally reproducible, alterable and everywhere. The monetary value of original handmade works of art skyrocketed in tandem with the historical reputations of the artists and the niche value of the art market. Copyright lawyers only realistically pursue cases where there are multi-millions to be made from in claims. This is not about pop art in the way you might expect, but that doesn't stop it being about the art of pop. Warhol and Liechtenstein pointed out the discrepancy between the value we give to visual artistic production in an age of photocopying and mass reproduction. Andy Warhol, Marilyn Monroe and Roy Lichtenstein might be mentioned briefly but are not lingered upon. It's more about intelligent pop music as important art form, from King Crimson to Squeeze to Pharrell Williams. Fact and fiction can be hard to unravel in the world of art and entertainment, but we're aware of the fact that fans and students alike like information as close to fact as possible and I do try for my own sanity as much as theirs. In an era of fake news the last thing we need is to hear that Brian Ferry didn't used to be a pottery teacher. You will hear many voices from every corner of the room and outside it. The commercially successful pop art that lingers in the public imagination is victorious because of that which it critiques. So what is the difference between normal pop and rock and art rock? The shallow answer is in depth. It is not that art rock is better per se, but it plunges depths and explores extremes that other more audience convenience oriented genres are less interested in probing. Art rock proclaims that pop and rock truly and humanistically expressed beyond the influence of commercialism, ease or convenience is as important and relevant an art form as any other, easily straddling the permanently mutually suspicious worlds of high and low culture. Art rock is non-populistic rock music with added depths and unexpected strands of culture attached. The various culturally biased critics might deem that view snobbish or elitist, but that only holds if you agree that the old proletariat new precariat aren't interested in penetrating depths of art. It's not a class thing, in other words, it's an art thing. The model by Kraftwerk may seem at first listen like a simple, elegant, keyboard-based techno pop song, and it is, but it also communicates its icy magic on many different levels. The aching dispassion of the vocals is matched by the efficient metronome of the electronic rhythm and the mix of romantic yearning and jealousy that passively aggressively taints the detachment of the lyrics. The Prokofiev meets Beethoven dynamics of the refrain send the listener back to parlour games in Weimar Republic re reception rooms, viewed through the sanitised prism of an analytical East Berlin laboratory. It's in these places where Kraftwerk, for handy Teutonic example, nods to pop and then walks assertively away, with just a financially astute glance back over the shoulder. Why does art become as important for some as belief is for others? Because there is an invisible dance between the maker and receiver, the handmade, imaginative ideas or experiments of a person in love with the thrill of creatively reaching wordlessly and eloquently across dimensions, straight into the soul of another. Is that manipulation or coercion? If it is, it's of the most benevolent consensual kind, an acquiescing feint of dominance and submission out of which everyone emerges satisfied. 
Art is the sensual expression of humanism and human truth, communicated unquestioningly, except by some critics, to simpatico others, those others being a receptive public and other artists. In a time of spiritual scepticism and scientific factual dominance, art straddles all those worlds of atheism and devotion, pokes a little, but generally spreads more of its own kind of love. The English countryside scenes of John Constable from hundreds of years ago rubbed up, in class terms, against the glamorised animals and tricorn hats of Gainsborough in his mistily broad vistas. J.M.W. Turner's stormy ships battered Dover and Doggerland, caught in tempest after tempest, the vortices he captured in the moment as dramatic as George Clooney in The Perfect Storm, or even C.S. Lewis in The Voyage of the Dawn Treader. William Blake may have said, damn the king, or words to that effect, seen angels in trees and written the lyrics to Jerusalem, but he was also very much the original Extinction Rebellion rebel, protesting through sideburns and white painter's shirts the dark satanic mills of that pesky, aspirational northern working class. A couple of hundred years later, Patrick Heron simplified psychedelic pebbles on the beach at St Ives, and his friend Peter Lanyon captured the angles and dynamism of the windsurfers, glintingly bourgeois off the peninsula. Ben Nicholson and his sculptor wife Barbara Hepworth simplified and smoothed these natural forms, for making sheer permanence where there had been natural chaos. While up in London, Francis Bacon scraped oil paint down drunken canvas, making his screaming popes of horror decades before Pope Benedict's dark, sunken eyes removed any doubt. Lucian Freud was kicking against the reflective work of his grandfathers in saving psychological lives by painting real, physical ones. Undulating flesh, real and alive, flowed from his mixing palette like carbohydrates into a mixing tube, as Lucian evidently failed to keep his trousers up, laying the ground for the eventual Me Too movement. David Hockney was working out of both Leeds and Los Angeles, and the 1960s coming from the other end of bespectacled sexual liberation, newly flamboyant in the repealing of the homosexuality law of 1967. Sheer blocked colours and forms blended in Hockney's happy view to make sardonic pop out of cartoon impressionism, as he handed his brush and sensibility round the back of the canvas to Peter Blake and Richard Hamilton, ready to collage with critique mass consumerism. Damien Hurst and Tracy Amin were waiting on the other side of Margaret Thatcher to become the new stars and the story, presenting dissected cows, crystallised sharks and tents as shrines to everyone they'd ever slept with. Fiona Ray had arguably made the hugest, most dominant canvases since Rothko, smearing blues, yellows and whites over London-shaped blobs and underground signs, the miasma melting in the white cube of the gallery. The later Banksy barely showed in galleries, more often on CD covers or street corners, by the Wailing Wall or on bridge end garages, poetically issue signalling from his palettes of templates and spray cans, little girls and gas masks, shopping trolleys and bathos. The Lowry's industrial age matstick men shows echoed in pedantry prison practice and early status quo. Alfred Wallace's naive painting of Cornish fishing harbours, bringing a patronising simplicity to cathedrals of complicated snobbery and high thoughts. Gilbert and George smeared excrement over stained glass, and Pythonesque, Morecambe and Wise style creep punk, and Ben Okri opted for the dried version of elephant dung in a painting destroying comment on the empire. Julian Opie cartoonifies the faces of celebrities. Boomer Marcus Harvey does the same for enormous killers, as William Hogarth looks forward from a Bacchanalian village feast from hundreds of years before, chicken leg in hand, shaking his head at multifarious British humanity. A bit soulless, a bit clever, very cool, snappy colours. This description of pop art could easily apply to Brian Eno's debut album 
Here Come the Warm Jets, or Bjork's 1905 sophomore LP Post. Can you hear colours? These records seem to strive to achieve that, with often the visual schemes of their strong covers influencing how the music was heard. Random stabs of extended synthesizer, weaving chord progressions of mystical intrigue led the listener's imagination down unknown rabbit rabbit holes, new hues and dynamics worming further into the brain, soul, with each repeated listen. Politics took a tumble too, as the public tires of right and left stances, fake news and debauched spectacle, becoming more important than the careerism of politicians and their increasing irrelevance beyond the caricatured images of fun pontificating on the news, the cartoonist Gerald Scarf scrawling manic in the corner of the room. Postmodernism's 40 year or so cultural battle, fought by Leotard, Baudrillard, Bart, Adorno et al., was looking a bit crusty and out of date. How can self reproducing postmodernism be out of date? I hear you wearily ask. The gradual combined efforts of P.J. O'Rourke, Roger Scruton, Douglas Murray, and Jordan Peterson, among others, had dragged the idealism of the protest left into the reality baiting actuality of now. The twisting of language and meaning inherent in postmodernism, the changing of society by the changing of mind via the language, was in trouble as populist governments all over the world were voted in in anti-political correctness protest votes against unmandated globalism. The people had had enough of looking at still cartoons, beds and sharks, and wanted to enjoy themselves with the modern, real-time Shakespeare gore of reality TV. Marcel Duchamp was widely considered to be the father of conceptual art, and was particularly active in Paris in the 1910s. Experimenting with cubist painting, rhetorical text and kinetic sculpture, he's found his grand display of beauty in his large glass, the bride stripped bare by her brothers. He worked slowly on this for years, between chess games. It consisted of eight foot, foot panes of glass with images of machinery pressed between them, based on the actual objects. The barrels, metalware and pipes made up the people of the title, as Duchamp brought his ready-made objects into a form of two-dimensional representation. Duchamp was always asking the question of what painting was, what sculpture was and what art was. <clears throat> he seemed to conclude on the fact that art was whatever got people talking, and when he presented his signed urinal, R. Mutt, at the Paris Open exhibition in those years, titled Fountain. Duchamp has presented the beautiful, functional, curved porcelain of a typical public urinal as art in itself. He had elevated it and celebrated both its purpose and surreal removal from it. This removal set the object up as a work of Dada art, an act of situational absurdism. The fact too that Duchamp was French, with that country's externally amusing cultural habit of urinating in public, helped to add more nuance to the story. And here the story became more important than the veracity of the piece. Duchamp had thereby demonstrated with cool detachment how the art of placing an object in an exhibition and the controversy around that can create the art too, an early act of media art on the wire. For Salvador Dali, Andy Warhol, Joseph Boys, Jeff Coons, Damien Hurst and Tracy Amin were all watching with excited curiosity from different times, angles and positions. Have controversial idea, make it, invent a story, present it, get paid, disappear. Duchamp wrote the book on this approach to the art world, the chess prayers version more than Picasso's more compulsive, inventively rapacious one. Duchamp was as outrageously fresh as the Beatles, if as arguably less charming or tuneful. <coughs> While that group seemingly grew up on screen and in front of the world's eyes, Duchamp arrived fully formed and glamorously vampiric in his cynical Peter Cushing meets Bertrand Russell reserve. 
entertainment to both John Lennon and Marcel Duchamp consisted of a refreshing and bold challenge to the mind. It was on that point that the two men turned. Duchamp's earth-toned cubist triumph new descending a staircase was no less striking and jarring, jarringly dynamic in its time than D D Lennon and the Beatles' I Am the Walrus, one by eye and one by ear. Until film and video makers began to get involved with the Beatles in the mid-60s, the making the promo for Rain, A Hard Day's Night, Help, Magical Mystery Tour and Yellow Submarine, Peter Blake, Robert Rauschenberg and Andy Warhol wrestled with the ghost of Duchamp in the grains between the films. We remember the lyrics incorrectly, or perhaps never learned them properly in the first place. We are as happy with this consensual cultural dissonance as we are with the contradictions between Bible myth and scientific fact. Anything that works for us and makes our lives better, more comfortable, we all say, despite those highfalutin words and principles. The thing about pop art is not so much the content itself as the spirit in which it is made. The staggering number of pop and rock songs revolve around the C, G, A minor, F chord sequence and various arrangements of it. There have been comedy musical skits parodying this fact, <coughs> but it speaks to the deathless ability for some musical messages to be cyclical, amorphous and not necessarily too challenging. As Queen Victoria died and the 19th century turned into the 20th, Great Britain had a huge navy, empire and reputation, but the United States was becoming no less a cultural centre. Paris was the traditional gravitational heart of the art world, and it continued to be so, albeit with the upstarts of the new world biting at its heels. Impressionism was a style of painting which captured the moment of action that the eye sees, not what the mind knows is there. Late Impressionism was dominated by the social scenes of Renoir and Manet, the glimpsed landscapes of Cézanne and the natural romanticism of Monet and Matisse. Now seen as the establishment to the point of being dull, the Van Goghs and Bonnards at the time were revolutionary in their spontaneous moments of light capture and existential energy. Picasso and Braque, watching Cézanne's closely, took his simplified block perceptions and developed the style known as Cubism. Imagine taking a photo of an apple from every angle, then sellotaping all the resulting photos together. It created a new and dynamic way of seeing objects and pretended the human eye was a camera lens. Film was like the motor car in the process of being born. Art at its best tends to reflect what is going on in the world of science, technology and politics as much as what is going on inside the artists themselves. <laughs>